All right, hello everyone. I'm Matt Kulikundas. Uh, this is my second major talk at CppCon, and two years ago I presented about the open source, the hash table that is now open sourced. But before I begin, I want to really clearly state this is the work of many people. Many of the people on the slides did the initial work. Many did the open sourcing work. Primarily, Shandel actually did the open sourcing work. The slides I'm about to present are very heavily the work of Sam Benzikin, who has done a lot of the optimizations in here. Uh, but by no way am I the primary or even the major effort in any of this. So I'm gonna start giving you a little overview of where we're going, because this talk jumps in pretty fast. I marked it in, on the menu as intermediate advanced, but that's in the New Zealand hiking leveling system, not in the American hiking leveling system. So we're gonna explore a few inter interconnected big questions around our hash tables. Um, what have we learned while deploying them across Google? Can we improve them for CPU efficiency? Can we improve, can we improve their memory for small tables? And can we automatically identify tables that are misbehaving at scale in a way that's useful? So that's sort of roughly where we're going. But I'm gonna start with background. There's a huge chunk to understand here, and I'm gonna blitz through what was my 2017 CppCon talk without any of the motivation. I'm just going to explain to you what. If you want to understand the why, go back to my 2017 talk. It's reasonable, I hope. Um, I'm also gonna ask folks, hold your questions until the end, unless it's a really quick clarification that you believe I can answer in one or two sentences. So there you have it. Let's start with a bit of terminology. The main container I'm gonna be talking about is flat hash set. This is sort of like a stood on ordered map in API, except that it's more like a vector than a linked list. It doesn't offer pointer stability, it keeps the values directly in memory and it moves them on rehashes. It has a metadata array, which stores metadata, obviously, about the things, and it has the slot array where the actual values are stored. Logically, these are two separate arrays. Internally in the implementation, they're just one thing because nobody wants to allocate twice. So when I refer to position three, I'm often referring to both the control byte in the metadata array and the slot in which the value at that position is stored. So now if we take 16 positions together, that forms a group. And you'll see why this 16 is important as I expand on it. The table itself just contains n groups. When we, look, when we take our hash code, ordinarily you start with a 64-bit hash code, we divide it into two parts. H1, which is the 57 high bits, not that we guarantee we will continue to use the 57 high bits, but it is right now, and the seven low bits, which is H2. H1 is what you take the modulus of. It's your traditional, like, I'm gonna mod by my table size in order to find my spot in the hash table. The seven bits in H2 go into the control byte in the metadata. We need the extra bit to be even more meta. This is the core insight that made, makes Swiss table fast. This is a little bit of code that uses SSE um, talking with Chandler last night, I actually learned that it uses SSSE3. But that's a streaming SIMD extension. It's a, it is an instruction that basically all CPUs have that allows you to do a 16 wide probe, uh, sorry, 128 byte probe all at once. So, um, I'm gonna break this apart into smaller parts because I don't actually speak assembly and most people shouldn't. This is what it's doing sort of in pictures. You give it a one byte thing and say, okay, here's, a 16, here's an array of 16 bytes. Give me ones where they match and zeros where they don't match. It's pretty easy. Let me break it step by step. This instruction just splats out one byte 16 times. This instruction takes two 16-byte vectors and outputs the mask, zeros where they don't match, ones where they match. This instruction collapses that back down into 
a not specialized giant thing, just a single thing that you can scan. So you put all three of those together, and you get the thing you want, a bit mask that says, what are your potential matches? It's a little bit like a bloom filter in that regard. It can have false positives, but... So we've wrapped that up. That looks like how we use it. And now I'm gonna walk us through what is the core loop of Swiss table? How does it actually do anything? I'm not gonna cover anything other than find in any of these slides because everything starts with find. Find is just like the only thing you have. You wanna insert an element, first you find where it goes. You wanna erase an element, first you find it. You wanna emplace an element, well then you find it and put it there. Everything is find. So the first thing you do is you figure out what group you're in. So you take the h1 hash, mod by number groups, then, because I watched Ale Alexandrescu's talk, it's an infinite loop. Everything's an infinite loop. Uh, so, you, from the group, you're gonna just advance through the groups, one at a time, as you're trying to find groups that have matches. Here's where the smarts come in. That H2 and this match, from what you saw earlier, is saying, okay, in this group, these are the indices that are potential candidate matches for us. If it's a candidate match, then we actually need to run EQ. Right, in, your actual, in an actual hash table, you're running the equality funk tour. I should tell you, all of these slides are kind of 80% true, because going for 100% true actually really, really impedes understanding of something this complicated. So here we're just using EQ, it's slideware. And you keep advancing groups over and over, forever and ever, and you never stop. Well, okay, sometimes you have to decide, nope, I didn't find it, it's empty. And here we make use of one key fact. The table will contain at least one empty element. We never get to 100% capacity. So these are the two parts where we use the hash code, logically speaking, right? The h1 hash, mod the num groups, is encoding information about the hash code of the object. And then the h2 code is giving us a little bit more information. And it's only when both the H1 and H2 bits match, or really the portion of the H1 bits we're currently looking at based on our modulus, and the H2 that we actually call the more expensive EQ function. So this lets you do most of your work just burning through one byte at a time on those instructions. It's very dense in L1 cache. Because the metadata array is where all of the action in this happens, I'm just gonna drop the slot array from these slides. You can just pretend it's there, it works well enough. I'm also gonna include more groups in these diagrams because I'm gonna need more groups later. I belighted earlier, there's a special stop marker. It's the last, last entry gets a, slot, a stop marker. And the entire purpose of that is if you're just scanning across like an iterator, it tells you when you've reached the end. So I'm gonna, as a slight shift, I'm gonna start talking about the rollout across Google. This is a rollout across Google by spelling count. Spelling count is a sort of weird thing to use, but as a code janitor whose job is to get spelling counts of things I don't like to zero, it actually tells me when I'm done. In this graph, you'll notice that I have both the flat hash map and set, which Flat is what I've been talking about. I also have node hash map and set. Node is like flat hash map, but if you imagine flat hash map as a vector, node is a vector of unique pointers. It gives you pointer stability, which means it's much easier to convert legacy structures like GNU CXX hash map or stood unordered map over to a node hash map because you maintain pointer stability. And pointer stability is a very difficult property to figure out statically. It's hard to look at code and say, oh yeah, this code doesn't need pointer stability, or this code does. Uh, it's called escape analysis. Compiler optimizers hate it when you force them to use escape analysis. Fun trick, though, you can really bother them. So this sort of shows what you're doing, and, but it doesn't quite give you the sense of how much of this is code changes from our large-scale changes, migrating people from the blue and the red to the yellow and how much of this is people on their own writing the green or the others, 
or how much of this is people migrating the yellow to the green? This is by spelling count. We're no longer going to 100%, this is just total counts. And so what you can see, early in the process when we were really pushing on the large scale changes to roll this out, we made a lot of really fast progress. Uh, if you recall Titus's talk from earlier today, or if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll wait for you to go watch Titus's talk. Great talk, wasn't it? Um, if you recall, changing types that cross API boundaries is a really hard problem. And we kinda just punted on it. We just throw changes at the wall, and if they compile, we ship them, and if they don't compile, we bury them out back. And it got us to 70%. It's a surprisingly effective strategy. Um, we've hit diminishing returns there. We're probably not going to get past 70%, or much past it. But you can see that green line is growing tremendously. And one of the reasons for that is training and education. We've told people that's the one they should use. And the other is, once you do the hard work of moving them from the blue to the red to the yellow, they actually convert to the green themselves. They know pointer stability, and the types are very, very similar in all their outward behaviors. So we've fixed most of the pointer stability issues that come with these migrations. These migrations really, really bump into Hiram's Law. If you haven't heard it before, I'll give you a moment to read it while I enjoy some of this fine Diet Mountain Dew. Hiram actually didn't realize how deep the truth of his statement was when he made it. He thought it was a sort of flip observation. But it's actually like entropy. You can fight against it, you can minimize it, but you cannot eliminate it. It's always present, it is a thermodynamic truth of your code base. So how does Hiram's law show up with hash tables? What, ha what factors have we found in our migrations? Anyone know what this prints offhand? Okay, that, that wasn't entirely a fair question. What is this print if your standard library is libstud C++ version 5.1? Come on, there are only six options. It's 312, and I know this offhand. I learned this without ever trying because I have seen so many tests that just do this. It's shocking, I mean, Welcome to Google, we actually wrap it up in a protobuffer, but this pattern shows up over and over. Fortunately, we were, we were kind of planning on this when we started the Swiss table effort, this, this conversion, and we wanted to never have to fight this fight again. We wanted this to be the time we spilled our blood, and the last time. So we added randomization. When we compute the H1, we mix in the pointer address of your bucket, and we use address spa space layout randomization in order to ensure that different, different tables will have different hashes, you restart the same binary, you'll still get different hashes, you get different hashes. Now, H1 only chooses between groups. So if your table only has one group, you're not getting any randomization from this. But we figured, okay, we couldn't figure out a way to do it in opt that was fast enough, so in debug mode, about half the time, we fill the thing backwards, just to keep you on your toes. In debug mode, this only returns true 50% of the time, give or take. This does come at a cost. Everything comes at a cost. Ask Chandler. In fact, go watch his talk, I'll wait. It was a great talk, wasn't it? Let's go back and look at this dedupe service someone has implemented. But let's not look at the code so directly. Let's take a step back and think of this as if we were a systems architect. Okay, that may have been too far of a step back. Let's look at this like we're an SRE. So our dedupe service is receiving things and it's deduping them and it's handing them to a caching layer which then hands them to our business logic. And now let's th think about this like we're an SRE looking at a service outage. The dedupe service can get lists of length n, fact n, in any permutation, so n factorial size of inputs. And because its table is deterministic, it will always output a specific permutation on the output. So it's reducing your inputs from n factorial to n. 
And that's actually really useful for your caching layer. What does this look like if we had a deterministic input source, but we have non-deterministic hash tables? Now, we take something ordered, n inputs, and we can produce n factorial different outputs. And your caching layer has completely lost its cache hits rate, your service is falling over, you're demanding that I roll back a CL. Ideally, in an ideal world, your caching service would have a stronger sense of equivalence. It could do sorting or deduping or fuzzing. Like, it could also figure out when floating point numbers are close enough to consider each other equivalent. Um, gonna put a pin in floating point numbers. We'll come back to those in a bit. They're fun. Usually, people implement their dedupe service something like this. It's pretty simple, right? As you see things, you throw them into your hash table, and then you add them to your result, and you output them. And so I've ended up going into a lot of things and rewriting them to something like this. Now, no matter what the ordering of your hash table is, you preserve the ordering of your inputs. It's a useful property to have. It's actually also slightly more efficient, because now I'm not doing two passes across the data. If you wanted to collapse your inputs, you should call sort explicitly. If that was really what you wanted, you should have set it in your code. I mentioned floating point numbers a little bit ago. Turns out there are some simple summations over floating point numbers that are non-deterministic. Yet, you would be shocked that addition you've grown up with, you know and you love, it is not associative. Like, let that sink in for a second. A plus B plus C is not equal to A plus B plus C when you're using a float or a double. Nobody ever thinks about this, but it's true. And anyone who has a golden file test, who has a test that says, I ran my system, I gave it this input, and I expected 1.278934567 to come out, doesn't understand these differences between precision and accuracy. Now we're gonna take a slight turn. We're gonna consider an optimization that we made. Also, foreshadow. I'm told authors, good authors do it, good presenters should also foreshadow. So let's consider how our probing behavior happens across groups. We start by selecting whatever group our hash sends us to and then we advance to the next group, and then we advance to the next group. It's pretty easy. It's actually not linear, it's quadratic advancement, but for slideware, we do linear. Um, but what happens if we let our windows float? Can we break ourselves from this tyranny of group alignment? Instead of baking in this idea that it's mod num groups and our groups have size 16, can we drop this? Can we just say it's mod capacity and we advance by steps of 16? Let's see how it plays out when we use it. We pick a spot, okay. We advance once, seems all right. Let's do it again. Okay, that, that's less good. We just read straight off the end of our metadata array and right into our slot array and no one really knows what's there. It might be bad data, it might look like we're just not gonna go there. Notionally, what we wanted to do was this. We wanted to sort of have this floating window span across the thing. But that's just not how SSE instructions work. So, right, if our SSE instructions won't do this, what do we do? Well, we'll just make them happy. We're gonna copy the data over onto, we're gonna replicate the first set of bytes after the end of the initial bytes. It's unfortunate that we need this extra code, but we're gonna play out this line of reasoning before we actually decide whether we like or dislike anything. So now, great, we hash here, we can go, we see our replicated bytes, everything is good. The real question is how does this perform? We have microbenchmarks, okay? We have a lot of microbenchmarks, so we usually use graphs. And, you know, in general, what you're seeing, if you're really looking carefully in all of these, blue is the new implementation, orange is the old implementation, it's slightly better. The trend is positive, it's five to 10%. I'm gonna zoom in on a couple, a couple obvious examples. This is fine. This is what we're trying to optimize. Great, 
10% faster. I love it. And this is when the table is hot in cache. When the table is cold in cache, 10% faster. I love it. Okay, what about inserting when the table is hot in cache? This is 10 to 20% slower. This isn't really surprising because I did add code to the insert path. I could show you the result for cold tables, and it would look much, much worse, but it's not statistically significant, so I'm not going to. It's just a misleading graph. Also, do your statistical significance when you're benchmarking complex things. So let's answer the easy question first. Why is it slower? It's slower because we added an instruction. It's really not that surprising. There's some tricks you can do with math to make this not a conditional expression, and we do them in the actual implementation, but I didn't want to explain those tricks here. Go look at the code on GitHub. You'll find it. It's kind of cool. Okay. Why is it faster on find? Let's consider the case of doing finds. Or actually, we're considering how things get laid out, how they are inserted in order to understand finds. Both our tables start empty, and we want to make an insertion right there. In the old case, we align it to the group, and in the new case, our group is just right where we want it. Then we insert it right at the spot at the beginning of the group. We're going to do it again. Now we want to insert here. In the old case, we align it to the group. In the new case, we insert it just at the spot where we want it. In fact, we can do it again. So this is all pretty cool, but what is it really telling us, right? Logically, logically, this is just one group. That's all it is. And here, every single item here is its own starting point for a group. There are more groups, and every item is more likely to be the first item in its own group, which means it's the first that will be tested for equality statistically speaking. But is there a way to see this more directly in the code? So here we're just looking at the diff, right? And let's zoom in on this first change. What are we actually doing here? Remember, capacity is just num groups times 16. We've got four more bits in our h1 hash, or functionally four more bits in our h1 hash. That's why we're getting better performance here. So now we understand what we're trading off. Benchmarks are great for helping us understand what we trade off, but they're horrible because they don't tell you anything. They just tell you these facts, but they don't tell you what the relative value of these facts are. Fortunately, we have a way to cheat at Google. We just plug it into web search and measure the performance. You guys do that, right? So it's actually a performance improvement of about half a percent of web search's overall performance. That's really good. Like, web search uses a lot of CPUs. Um, also, it doesn't actually use that many hash tables, because for a service like web search? So this is great. So I think we should just ship this, right? Wait. Hey, Matt. Y Matt. Wait, Hi Hiram. <laughs> But we already randomized them. What do you mean? I build only in L2. Only in large groups? But we randomize and debug for small tables. I build only in L2, and I use small tables. And I depend on insertion order for those small tables. Oh, my god. This is the sort of entropy Hiram has always tried to warn us about. Watch what happens if I have a small table and I insert into it. The first insertion can go at the beginning for the old one. And for ours, it can go anywhere, wherever the floating group had it. The second insertion on the old one, always at the, be always at the beginning. People depended on this behavior. Fortunately, it was only about 20 people. We fought hard enough against it. We put in enough randomization that we could make this change. So on October, on October 30th, Sam Benzikin submitted this change. And then we all went trick-or-treating, and life was great. And then on November 2nd, just as the sugar from trick-or-treating was wearing off, someone opened up a bug. 
they were seeing a massive increase in the cost of the tables on their system. And they came to us and they said, no, this is like bad, this is slowed down. Like, can you help me fix it? And I said, oh God, Sam, can you help them fix it? <laughs> their code looked a little bit like this. I've simplified a lot of things here to get you this code. I'm gonna give you guys a moment to think about it and see if you come up with any answers while I enjoy this fine Diet Mountain Dew. Anyone spotted it? Really? All right, I'll give you a hint. A little bit of math. Anyone? This is why I needed Sam to fix it. We had four more bits of H1 hash available to us that we started using before we weren't using these four bits. And they were only using them. They were using the four bits that we had just given them to switch between their tables. So they got these four new bits and they were all the same for all their tables. And hash tables are fickle beasts. You give them an even slightly bad hash function and their performance falls off a cliff. We really ought to figure out a way to identify problems like this automatically and surface them better. But that's a detour for the end of the slides. I'm gonna go on a small detour here first. We're gonna talk about our second optimization, but a little more foreshadowing first so people can guess what this optimization is. Hopefully it's a little bit more clear or at least somewhat less surreal. How much memory do each of these use? I'm not talking about the memory of the flat hash set itself, just how much do they allocate? Turns out it's probably a little heavier than you think. This top one, right? You're gonna use 16 bytes for the metadata and then 16 bytes for the replication of the metadata and then 15 times your value type. So to put a single int into a flat hash set took 92 bytes. And to put a single string into your flash hat, flat hash set, assuming your string fit in its SSO and that your string was 32 bytes, your size of stood string was 32 bytes, was half a K. <sighs> well, let's see if we, or more likely Sam, can do anything about this. What are our actual requirements for this code? We have to be able to probe 16 past the end of our Sentinel in case our H1 puts us just before the Sentinel. We have to replicate the low bits in the, in the equivalent positions after our Sentinel. We have to have an empty slot somewhere. And we have to have a capacity that is a power of two minus one. I've never mentioned that before, but it's just a fact. We don't actually take a modulus, we do a bit mask because modulus is slow. Interestingly, nothing here requires that those extra empty slots have to be there in any real sense. They only have to be there in the metadata. And so there are some powers of two we've never considered. One, three, and seven. What about a table like this? We moved our end of slot marker over, and it still fits our requirements. We can probe 16 past it. We replicated the metadata. We have an empty slot somewhere. And it has a capacity of two, power of two minus one. So now, with this improved layout, we only need 18 bytes of metadata, and then some padding because value type. And so things are looking a little bit better. How big is a flat hash set of a single int now? It's 24 bytes. We've saved over two thirds from the original. How big is it for a flat hash set of string? Factor of 10 in savings. We save so much that we should probably change units. It's pretty easy to see why small tables are better. How did we do in the benchmarks? Actually, I'm not gonna show you. The find code didn't change, right? We should just ship this. This is great. What? I don't believe you. My hard code did a little bit change. But I, I don't care about people who hard coded the exact allocation size. And what do you mean pointer stability? No. 
I, we didn't guarantee that. I mean, oh my god, people are depending on our exact rehash timing? Imagine inserting elements into the old array versus the new. In the old array, we'd find a spot and put it somewhere. In the new array, we put it right at the beginning, in its only space. And then when we try and insert a second element, we have to rehash to grow it. The old array, we didn't. Fortunately, the third element actually is OK. So, small miracles. So how many people actually depended on pointer stability for, arrays, for tables with size less than 15? About 200. <laughs> 200 that we found and fixed beforehand. There are probably another 200 that we broke and they fixed themselves. Hiram really does extract a never-ending tax upon us. So remember how I said it would be great if we could figure out tables and stuff? Like, let's take a moment to sort of step back and think about what does the CPU profile for a really highly optimized system look like? It should spend almost all of its time inside the body of a really well-optimized data structure, like a hash table. And what does the CPU profile for a system that has been misconfigured look like? Well, it will spend all of its time inside a hash table. So let's play a game. I am going to show you two performance profiles. We should vote on who thinks the top profile, profile A, comes from something that has a bad hash function, and who thinks the bottom profile, profile 2, comes from something that has a bad hash function. A, raise your hands. I got Matt Godbolt with a tentative hand and nobody else. Two? Anyone voting for two? I got, a, I think people are pointing at Chandler? Oh, oh, Chandler voted in the first round. Matt Godbolt's very tentative hand was correct. <laughs> but the fact that it's not easy is really a damning statement about our tools. One more show of hands. Who has seen anything like the previous two slides before? Well, we got Matt Godbolt. That's good. He wasn't just guessing. Or maybe he was. This is, this is PProf. It is a great tool. Um, it collects all sorts of stuff. Right? You can use it to generate these graphs that you've seen. You can use it to generate the sort of textual output you've seen. It's all based on an open and extensible data format. I highly recommend people use it. It's awesome. So Google makes heavy use of the fact that PProf ex has this extensible data format. We will take all our different things. Chris Kennelly gave a talk, actually, earlier today on TC Malloc. Those of you who are here in the audience should create a time machine, go forward in time until the talk is released on YouTube, and then watch it on YouTube. But we use this to collect a ton of things. We use it to collect CPU profiles so that we can figure out, right, we will use SIGPROF to generate stack traces, which tells us what the CPU is doing. We use it to collect contention. Absil mutex has hooks in it to tell you when it has acquired a mutex after failing to acquire it for a while, so you can collect the data about contended mutexes. TC malloc, our allocation system, tracks allocations, and it can export memory usage. It's great. These are obviously too expensive to collect all the time, so we do sampled collection. Fortunately, our fleet is very, very large, and so sampling gets you accurate enough data. We surface this information in a bunch of different ways. So the real trick in trying to figure this out for hash tables is how can we get information from hash tables out to some kind of sampler in a reasonable way? This is kind of what you want to do, right? When your table is first constructed, you roll a die and you say, snake eyes, I get to sample. Um, but like, this is way too expensive. Also, you don't want the logic for how to sample in the hash table. You want that hidden in the sampler. So I'm going to introduce this concept of a sample handle into the table itself so that someone else can decide for me when to sample. Same idea. For the time being, I'm going to talk about how to make sampling more efficient 
before I go into what we're actually sampling, right? Because we don't want to just take a random number and do the sample rate. So we're gonna focus here on what the sampling routine does before we figure out when to sample. Kind of notionally, it would be nice to do something like this, where, okay, we're just gonna sample every nth one, because like that subtraction is super fast, and then we can just reset back to it. Unfortunately, one, this is not thread safe, and two, this is like, I don't, I barely know stats, and I know that this is bad. Every nth table is gonna get weird aliasing artifacts. I'm gonna warn you, this is my view of statistics. Right, like, I'm gonna do my best to explain the, st the stats that follow, but like, try not to ask too many questions, please. So computing a number just to check if it's zero is sort of, you're doing an experiment to see if it succeeds, and there's actually a distribution to model this, how many experiments do you need to do? or to model this statistical thing. It's, you've rolled a die, did it come up zero? It's called a Bernoulli distribution. Great, but why is that useful? I've just switched from a distribution you know about, uniform, to a distribution you don't know about, Bernoulli. Well, it turns out that repeated applications of a Bernoulli distribution until it succeeds is another distribution. It's called a geometric distribution. And in fact, you can make this change. And now we're back to doing this with just a single subtraction, except for when we decide to sample. We, when we decide to sample, we have to recompute the math to figure out when we're next going to decide to sample. Fortunately, that was already expensive. We were going to sample this one, so we're okay with that price. We're going to assume that all our threads are independent. Is this assumption valid? No, but we don't care. Like, one of the things Cassie has told me is, if you're okay with stating your assumptions, you can do it in statistics. I'm going to assume that it's okay for me to treat my threads independently. And if you don't like my conclusions, well, that's your right. So hopefully you made it this far, or are willing to just take my word for it on the stats. I'm not gonna go into any more depth on stats, but there are more tricks in the code itself to make the stats work out a little bit better. I really suggest you go look at it in the Absell repo. It's in everybody's favorite directory, internal. So now we know how to sample, and we have to decide when to sample and wh what information to record. Con construction for a flat hash set currently is super cheap. No allocations, nothing. People often like put a flat hash set on their stack just in case they're gonna want it later, and then they don't. They early return out of their function, or that flag isn't enabled for that prod thing. So we don't wanna slow down this case. Ideally, we wanna sort of inject this little bit of overhead into a spot where they won't notice it, like the first time they allocate. We can get away with it here. So now we know when we want to sample. We know how we want to sample. We just need to figure out what we want to sample. So what would a useful monitoring system give us? It should tell us if our tables are big. It should table, tell us if our tables are both big and empty. It should tell us if our tables have really started probing a lot. And if they've started probing a lot, they should tell us something about their hash function so we can figure out, like, in what way is it bad. It should also have no overhead. Okay, we're gonna give a little on that one. So what can we sample that will fit this? If our table is big, that's pretty easy. If our table is big and empty, that's also pretty easy. It just keeps the size of it. If we have to probe too much, it gets a little bit harder. We kind of want the average probe length, but in order to have the average probe length, you can't just take the total probe length and divide it by the size, because if someone does, insert erase, insert erase, insert erase, insert erase, over and over, your size will be one and your total probe length will be quite large. So you actually need the num erases, and then you can get your average probe length. Also, how, how will it tell us if your hash function is bad? Like, we could try and keep every single hash that's been inserted, but that's gonna be really expensive. Like, what we really want is to distill this down a little bit. 
all inserted hashes? No. What if we keep a running bitwise or and a running bitwise and of our hashes? In this case, the or is going to go to FFFF and the and is going to go to zero because, in theory, all your bits should be flipping back and forth randomly. And if any of those don't happen, your hash function has stuck bits. And as we saw earlier, stuck bits destroy performance. Best of all, you can actually compute these incrementally, right? It's just an or equals and an and equals. It's very, very fast. So the code that reads the samples might, of course, be in a different thread than the code that is pushing this data. So we're going to throw a std atomic on it. Everyone loves std atomic. Well, we also need to know what table is the guilty party. We need to know who did this. At this point, I think this looks pretty good. Like, I, I want to just submit this thing and see what we can learn, right? You know, I, I kind of expected to see you here. I, I wasn't sure why, though. No, I, I did not think about the syscalls that my hash table could make. Let's do some quick surveys. Who thinks that this is allowed to call malloc? OK, hands are gradually coming up. Yes, I, I agree. This should be allowed to call malloc. OK, who thinks that this is allowed to call malloc? There are a lot fewer hands. OK, who thinks this is allowed to call Futex? Futex, for those who don't know, is the system call that often deep in the guts underlies a mutex acquisition. OK, how about this? Is this allowed to call Futex? Right, these are really sort of squirrely things. Is, does this code leak memory? I'm going to give you a moment to read it while I enjoy this fine Diet Mountain Dew. Yeah, Hiram has made his point yet again. I can admit, I, I, I kind of knew this was going to come. I actually just submitted it so I would find out. That's how I do a lot of my things. Titus says I'm a monster. I, wait a minute, I want to see that last one again. What are they doing here? They're using an arena allocator to avoid a whole bunch of small allocations. Okay, that, that makes sense. But they only have a small bunch of small allocations because they're using a node hash set. That's weird. Maybe I'll just clean this up because... They have a whole bunch of small allocations and they're using a node. Let's just switch them to a flat hash set. Great. That got a ton simpler. Anyone remember what std hash of int is in most standard libraries? I heard it over there. Oddly not from Marshall. It's the identity. Yeah, the identity turns out to have very poor entropy. <laughs> Fortunately, this is really easy to fix. Ah, much better. So here's my change. Boiled it up sent it to the owner of the code for review, and I submitted it. And it just slipped in. No one noticed. It was completely quiet for two weeks until I get an email out of nowhere. As it turns out, that hash table was at the core loop of Google's walking directions, and walking directions in Japan has a higher connectedness for, I don't know, reasons. The team had been unable to diagnose this issue using their CPU profiles. They looked a little like this. It's a bit hard to read, so I'm going to zoom in. That was your hint that they're probing a lot. Unless you know deeply that that is our probe step, you're probably not going to spot it for you. But it comes out clear as day that your table has a very large probe length when you really can switch to it with good statistics. So do you remember our pprof examples from before? Let's see how those are, look different with hash tables that are collected based on the profiling we've sort of built out. 
So we're looking at the core loop of our benchmark. It uses a ton of tables. This isn't really surprising. Uh, I'm going to assign two members of the audience as external memory. Mr. Godbolt, can you remember the first number, 6997, or about 7K? All right. Mr. Marshall, or Mr. Clow, can you remember the second number in the red? Call it 15K. This is the sort of total number of tables allocated. You have to remember these numbers. If you don't, it will ruin my entire talk. So let's look at what metadata we got from this, right? Our bad hash tables have really high probe lengths. There are a bunch more. The other tags show up, but like I'm just zooming in on the tags we want right now. And our good tables, not so high probe lengths. So let's restrict ourselves to only considering those tables with high probe lengths and see what happens. We can set our tag focus to say, oh no, only the tables whose probe length is four or more. And our original, we had, how many do we have? Okay, so about 7K, and now we have about 7K. So roughly 100% of our tables had bad probe lengths. Um, Mr. Clow? 15 and a half K, and now we're down to 2K. That's actually a huge reduction. So here, it's really easy to see which of these just has a pathological hash function? Perhaps our other tags can shed more interesting light. What bits are stuck? Negative 2048? Right, negative 2048 is actually most of our bits are stuck. <laughs> this is indeed a very poor hash function. So we run these things in production. We collect the data from them all the time. We're building out pipelines as I speak in order to automatically surface to us issues that we can you know, optimize and get promotions off of. Um, and every few weeks, somebody just kind of IMs me out of the blue and says like, oh my god, my hash table is bad. What can I do? And like, the answers vary. Usually, it's stop writing your own hash. Use absale hash, like nine times out of 10. And the 10th time, it's switch to an array. So this global analysis stuff is really useful. You just have to get something that shows you where your problems are. I'm now going to open the floor to questions. I might make you repeat or speak slowly, because this room has a really weird echo when people talk. Hi there. Earlier, I remember you had me on the graph and said this one shows that our data was hot with the cache. I'm actually going to warn the person on the camera. I'm going to walk down towards the mic so that I can hear him. So when you first put up all those graphs, you, yep. had a, you said this one here, this was when all our data was hot and in cache. So I was wanting to know, does Google Benchmark that we can download have something that tells us, how did you know it was in cache? By construction of the benchmarks, the way that I knew it was hot in cache is that there are two ways I construct the benchmark. One is that I make a, a single table and I hit it repeatedly. And one is that I make a billion tables and I just kind of like round robin through them so that they like just pollute my cache. And that's like a pre-step, like before? The what, in the design of the benchmarks, you, oh, I, it's, it's yeah. Done no, it's not done for us. In the benchmarks that I wrote for hash tables, which is actually open sourced. There's a GitHub slash Google slash hash table dash benchmarks. It's open. I want to pull in everyone's hash table into it. I want to have a good conversation about it. Uh, Facebook's hash tables are already in there, F14. Uh, I've gotten a few of the Facebook people to help make sure I have the config for it correct. Like, do it. It also comes with like basic Python analysis scripts so you can compare these. Wait till you get to the mic. Two things. Did you experiment with using AVX2 or AVX5 for compression? Yes, we did. And we saw no appreciable benefit for going to 32 wide probing. However, it does make, we did those experiments before we did the small table optimizations. So it made your small tables ridiculously big. Um, and also, not as many architectures have them. And so you do restrict yourself a bit there. Yes, we looked at Robinhood probing, and it was just a loss. It 
turns out to be like all the extra complication logic in it, like blows your inlining budgets, blows your caches on that. Um, and the fact that you can just do a 16 deep probe like that just is made of such win that the like, I'm gonna left pack everything in my, is not a big deal. Anyone else? I really should have brought the Diet Mountain Dew. So sometimes you can remove some operation out, operations out of your hash table and get better algorithm for other operations. Absolutely. Um, any, any experience with this? So one of, the, one of the challenges that we had for this is we really wanted to fill the standards API so that we could do the conversions. Um, someone else at Google has a slightly faster hash table that they've implemented specifically for machine learning based on the core observation that in machine learning, sometimes it's just okay not to insert things. Be like, you tried to insert, I have too many collisions for that, just go away. And like, that allows you to like, have hard-coded constants for a lot of things that used to be unbounded loops. And they also said like, well, sure, stood pair KV, that's what the standard wants, but I wanna put all my keys here and all my values here. And like, if you can do that, you get much better data packing also. And so if you can weaken the standards requirements, you can always find optimizations. But we were rest restricting ourselves to implementing a standard container, mostly. So it sounded like some of your Hiram's law cases were not actually code breaking, but slowing down. Yes. So what, what is, in your mind, the relationship between the responsibility of the developer with respect to Hiram's law and performance breaks rather than uh, corrections breaks? Well, so let's say I just put computing digits of pi in the body of make unique. It's still conformant, but it's not good. Like, there is some implied guarantees about performance, and when people have built production services and their service starts to fall over, it's really hard to tell them, like, no, nah, I just don't care that you're 10x slower. Like, maybe you should have been nicer to me. <laughs> but they slowed down because they broke your contracts. Did they, though? They had a hash table, they inserted things, they got them out, they expected their hash table to be fast. I even told them, this is the hash table you should use when they were like a shiny new nuclear. <laughs> yes, Hiram? I got one more question. Please. So uh, now that your end might be done, do people depend on their end location? I suspect they do, but I haven't found them yet. And I'm afraid that if I turned off the randomization, people would start relying on it not being there faster than they're relying on it being there. So you give them consistent results 20% of the time. <laughs> Marshall makes the observation, we give them consistent results 20% of the time. I, I mean, potentially? It's also like wedging in randomization in your libraries at just the right points is very hard to do because you want it to be fast. You want that and like, I've gone off to calculate, you know, a Bernoulli distribution is not a thing that people appreciate. All right, thank you.